Hello, my name is Michael Kaler, and I am the lab manager for the diffraction facility located at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Before we begin, let me ask that you please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications if any of our videos help you out. Here we have the high temperature setup in the Empyrean by Malvern Panalytical. We have the Anton Parr HTK 1200N high temperature stage. I don't have these options hooked up right now, but we have inlet and outlet gas ports if we want to perform the experiment in an inert gas atmosphere such as argon or nitrogen. There is also a vacuum port right here that we can use to hook up a turbo pump to reach high vac. But this setup is just for an experiment in air. For our incident beam, we have the programmable divergence slit for the prefix module, and for the diffracted beam, we have the fixed anti-scatter slit. A lot of these optics are similar to what we would normally use for powder diffraction. The main difference being here, instead of a programmable anti-scatter slit, we simply have a fixed anti-scatter slit. If you want to learn more about these optics, I recommend that you watch our tutorial video on how to perform powder diffraction, which I will link above. In this case, we need two sets of optics, one for aligning our sample in the beam, and one for measuring the sample. Because for alignment, we will be shooting the x-rays from the source directly into the detector, we need to insert an attenuator to absorb some of those x-rays. As we can see, it is a copper 0.1. To insert it, you want to align it like this and place it just to the left of the solar slit. It should loosely slide in there. Next, we have the solar slit. I'm just going to use a 0.04 radian. Here, we have the programmable divergence slit, the mask, and the anti-scatter slit. For alignment, we want the programmable divergence slit to be 1 32nd of a degree, so we will set that with the computer. That means that the anti-scatter slit needs to be 1 16th of a degree, because it needs to be two times whatever the divergence slit is. For the diffracted beam side, like I said, we have this fixed anti-scatter slit, which we can see right here. It is a five millimeter slit. That just slides into that slot and at some point it clicks. So you just want to make sure it is well positioned. Here we have our large solar slit, our nickel filter to get rid of the K-beta radiation, and then our detector. For alignment, if you want, you can remove the large solar slit I believe that is the more official way of doing it. I have tested it both ways personally and don't really see a difference, so I'm just going to leave it in there for alignment purposes because that is one less thing that I need to remember to put back in when I am ready for my measurements. Here we have the sample holder. I am going to lift it by the square portion. Right here you can see two holes and those two holes correspond to these two rods. What we are going to do is insert the rods into the holes, making sure that this rod here is towards the back of the chamber. As long as the rods are going into the holes here, we don't have to worry about where the sample is in relation to the opening, because as long as the rods are going through, the sample is oriented correctly. Be very careful when holding this throughout the entire loading of the sample. I did have one user once drop this, it broke this little stem part, and it had to be sent back to Anton Parr for repairs, so be very, very careful holding this. I will line up the rods in the holes, and then I will support it and start lifting. It should slide up pretty smoothly. If it doesn't, that means that the sample holder is probably tilted somewhat, so just readjust how it is sliding up. Once it is all the way up, you want to start to tighten these. I'll tighten them a little bit, 
not put a lot of pressure on it, going diagonal when possible. Then I'll go back and retighten everything. Finally, we want to take our orange cable here and plug it into the bottom. If it doesn't slide up right away, rotate it and eventually it should. And that's it. Once the orange thermocouple cable has been plugged into the bottom of the sample holder, go ahead and come over here to switch the power switch. You'll see the heater light is flashing off and your Eurotherm should start booting up. Give it a moment for the Eurotherm to fully start up. Here we see the temperature and a standby light. Once you see that, go ahead and push the heater button. You'll notice that it goes from flashing orange to the green on. Now that we have changed our optics and loaded our sample, let's look at data collector. We need to go to incident beam optics and diffracted beam optics in order to tell the computer what hardware we have installed on the system. Let's first look at incident beam optics. I will double click and I get this window. The prefix module is the programmable divergence slit. The divergence slit for alignment needs to be 1 32nd. Because of that, we physically installed the 1 16th anti-scatter slit. I'm going to use a 10 millimeter fixed incident beam mask and don't change this number. Beam knife, we don't have one installed, so it says none. Solar slit, I'm using the 04 radian. I have a filter, but it is on the diffracted beam side, so it is none for this side. I did install a beam attenuator, so I will choose the copper 0.1. Change the usage to do not switch, and click activated. The mirror is none. I will click OK. This window tells you to physically change on the system the things that you changed in the software. I already did, so I can click OK. Because it is so important for you to insert that beam attenuator, it reminds you of that fact separately. As long as you are sure you inserted that beam attenuator, go ahead and click OK. Let's go to Diffracted Beam Optics, double click. For high temperature measurements, we want FAS or Fixed Anti-Scatter Slit. The anti-scatter slit that we want to use is the only one in this lab that says non-ambient, so it is that 5 millimeter. We have no receiving slit. We have the nickel filter to get rid of the beta radiation. There is no beam attenuator on this side. For the detector, for alignment purposes, we want to change the usage to receiving slit 0D. I will also highlight this, type in 0.1, and hit tab on the keyboard. We see that it changes the value slightly here and makes it three active channels, which is what we want. Collimator, none. Solar slit, we have the large O4 solar slit not the regular, and the mask is none. I will click OK. Be patient while it applies the changes. And then I will come over here and click the instrument settings because I like to watch these numbers change during alignment. If you are using the batch file, all you need to do is go to Measure, Program, Find the batch file for alignment, so I'm going to use this one. If you don't see it in the screen here, you can browse and navigate your folders to find it. But this is what I want. Open. I'm not saving any of these scans, so that is why it says not saved. As such, once this window pops up, I will just click OK. Let me move some of this stuff. 
the first thing that it is doing is making sure that any offsets are cleared out. The current is 40 milliamps and the tension is 45 kilovolts. You see here that it set all of our position values to zero. And now it begins the alignment scans. It starts with a two theta alignment. What that means is that the source stays at zero position and the detector moves slightly. We are trying to find out where the source is shooting directly into the detector. Hopefully that is pretty close to zero degrees. It looks pretty good. Once the scan is complete, the software will find the position of the maximum value of that peak. And we see that it occurred at about 0 0.0016 degrees. Next, it is aligning in Z. It moves the Z to a low position, and in that position, X-rays are shooting directly into the detector. Once Z moves up, at some point, it will start to block the X-ray beam, which is what we see here. That is how we know where our sample is. The software plots the derivative of this curve and places the Z position at the maximum of that pink curve which we see here at 7.122 millimeters. Next, we are aligning omega. An omega alignment determines where the X-ray beam is parallel to the top of your sample. Here we see that we are a little off. It is about half a degree. We see here that the omega is about 0.54. Omega and Z are coupled, so if one changes, the other one tends to change. What this batch program does is that it goes back and forth a total of three times and tests each one. It is my experience that within three iterations, the alignment has stabilized. I will go ahead and speed this video up a little bit so we don't have to sit here quite so long and watch it. Now we see that the batch file has completed. Our angles are now zero because they have been saved as offsets. If we go to user settings, find calibration offsets, we can see what the software determined were our offsets. We can click OK here. You don't have to go look at that, I just wanted to show you. Now that alignment is complete, we can switch back to our measurement optics, so let's go do that. We need to remove the attenuator, so just slide that out. We will be setting our divergence slit to something else. I typically use one fourth of a degree. So then the anti-scatter slit needs to be one half of a degree. Let me put that back in. And then that is it for hardware on the incident beam side. On the diffracted beam side, I didn't make any physical changes for alignment purposes. If you removed the solar slits, go ahead and reinsert those for your measurement. Other than that, we are ready to go back to the computer. We can now set up our experiment. Let me first point out that if you don't see a temperature here, if it says that it is not connected or something to that effect, then all you need to do is go to Tools, Controller Connection, and then make sure that there is a check mark in this box. You'll see that if I uncheck it, it says that the temperature controller is not responding. If I check it, well, let me try that again. There we go. Then we get the temperature back. I will close that. Let's go into incident beam optics and diffracted beam optics to announce the changes we made. I will double click. Prefix module doesn't change. The divergence slit, I will use one fourth of a degree. 
I physically changed the anti-scatter slit to be one half. I didn't change the mask. Still no beam knife. Suller slit remains the same. No filter. Beam attenuator, I removed that. And mirror doesn't change. I will click OK. I will click OK because I made those changes. I didn't physically change anything on the diffracted beam optics, but I still need to come in here and make a change. Prefix module remains the same. Anti-scatter slit, receiving slit, filter, beam attenuator. They all remain the same. The detector needs to change to scanning line detector 1D, and then it should automatically change to the correct values here. Collimator remains the same. Solar slit, if you removed this for alignment purposes and chose none at the time, then you will want to come in here and change it back to large of whichever one you are using. Mask is none. OK. Come back to my measurement settings. Before I forget, because it is something that is very easy for me to forget, I want to come in here and double click the temperature. I want to change this select automatic height control model and my experiment is in air. So I will choose this as I am using the HTK 1200N. If I choose this and click OK, we see this little section pop up here. What this does is that it changes your Z position as the system heats in order to account for the thermal expansion of the alumina. This is important because if you don't do this, your peaks will shift due to a combination of the thermal expansion of your sample and the alumina. Let me point out something that is a little glitchy in my version of Data Collector. Usually when I activate the height controller, it will say status active, which is great. Sometimes though, it will say status inactive and it won't warn me when it says this. If it is inactive, it means that the height alignment will not work and it is just going to keep the Z position at whatever I have set here. If that happens to you, you can come in here, go to your sample stage and click none apply, go back to whichever setting you need to be on, and click OK. Now that all of this is set, we are ready to make our program. If you made a program in the past for one of the other stages, such as Reflection Transmission Spinner, it will not work with this configuration. We want to click either this button or File, New Program. We want the program to be an absolute scan and click OK. Let me close this so we can see better. The first thing I'm going to do is come into settings. If you want, you can change all of these settings to match the settings that you put into these two tabs. If you do that, once you run the program, it will compare these settings to these settings to make sure that they match. If they don't match, it will warn you that you may have made a mistake. I'm not going to do that for this video, but if you don't set anything else, you should come down here to the detector and set it to the pixel, if that's what you're using. Those are the correct settings, and then click OK. We can set up whatever start angle and end angle that we want. I will do 10 to 90 degrees, maybe with a 0.026 step size and 50 seconds per step, which gives me a 10 minute experiment time for each individual scan. I don't know if these settings are great. Yours will likely be different as every sample is different, but I'm just doing this for an example. Once I have my program made, I will go to File, Save As, let me find my, I'll go to YouTube, Programs, 
and I will call this something generic like HTXRD single scan. Once I have my single scan file saved, I will come up here to File, New Program, and this time I will choose a non-ambient program. Here we see the configuration. It should automatically set to the correct one. Click OK. Here is where I can start making my temperature profile for the experiment. We see here start at 25 degrees. If I want a room temperature scan, I can just click the next line, insert a measurement program, browse, go to YouTube, programs, and choose my single scan. Here we can choose where to save the results and how to name them but I will handle that later. We see that it inserts the item above whichever line is highlighted. Then I can insert a non-ambient setting, set it to 100 degrees at 20 degrees per minute, and that will take about four minutes to heat. I like to build in some sort of wait time to make sure that everything has reached equilibrium, so I will insert a timer setting and choose, I don't know, the time is dependent on how much of a temperature difference I have, how quickly I am changing temperature. I might do about five or seven minutes for this type of change, and then choose OK. Here is the wait function. We can left click here, press Ctrl C on the keyboard, left click here, and Ctrl V to create another single scan. These three steps I will want to repeat at every desired temperature. I will left click here, hold Shift on the keyboard, left click here, Ctrl C on the keyboard, left click here, and then Ctrl V. I will paste this as many times as I want different temperature steps. Let me point out that if you want to highlight multiple rows, you need to click here as you are doing your clicking. If you left click here, hold shift on the keyboard and click here, you see that it does not highlight multiple rows. So keep that in mind. Here I have the 25 degrees. We are going to 100 degrees. I can double click here, change that to 200 degrees if I want, come here, 300, 400, and you can do as many of these as you like. You can do it on warming up and then on cooling. It is however you want to design your experiment. At the end, we see that it resets and goes back to room temperature. It also has a finish. If we want to set up the file names and where to save them, we can come down here to File Name Settings. I will click this box to tell it what folder to save it in. I can click YouTube, Data. I can create a new folder for High Temperature XRD. I can even do a new folder for a YouTube example. And then save it in there. We see that appear here. I will click this if I want to give it a prefix. I will call it the YouTube sample. I like to click this button here to use the item number and the file name. The item number is simply the row number. This is especially helpful if you are collecting data on warming and cooling. Let me click OK and we will see here what the new file name is. It puts in the prefix YouTube sample. It has the item number, which corresponds to the row number, like I said, and then non-ambient. For that, it will simply insert the temperature that you are currently sitting at at the time of measurement. Once we have that all set, we can come over here to X-ray settings. If this is going to run overnight, I like to choose set when program is finished. 
set it back to 45 and 20 so that the x-ray tube will go into standby settings after it is done. I will come up here, file, save as, go to my YouTube folder, programs, I will call this my HTXRD batch scan. I am now ready to go ahead and measure program. I will browse, go find that program, and there we go. We see all of our file names, so we have our different temperatures in them now. Like I said, if we were doing this on warming and cooling, we might go to 400, and then our next one would be at 300. So that is really where those item numbers come into play, because instead of having two files that just say 300, maybe with an underscore one or underscore two, we can organize it this way with I11, I14, and I17. It really shows us the order everything is occurring. As long as all that looks good to you, just click OK, and then the experiment will begin. I'm not going to go through and show you all of the data collection, but I will end the video here. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Otherwise, I thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day.